The Queen of Spades by Alexandra S. Pushkin Part 1 There was a card party at the rooms of Naramov of the Horse Guards. The long winter night passed away imperceptibly, and it was five o'clock in the morning before the company sat down to supper. Those who had one ate with a good appetite, the others sat staring absently at their empty plates. When the champagne appeared, however, the conversation became more animated, and all took a part in it. And how did you fare, Surin? asked the host. Oh, I lost, as usual. I must confess that I am unlucky, I play mirandole, I always keep cool, I never allow anything to put me out, and yet I always lose. And you did not once allow yourself to be tempted to back the red? Your firmness astonishes me. But what do you think of Hermon, said one of the guests, pointing to a young engineer. He has never had a card in his hand in his life, he has never in his life laid a wager, and yet he sits here till five o'clock in the morning watching our play. Play interests me very much, said Hermon, but I am not in the position to sacrifice the necessary in the hope of winning the superfluous. Hermon is a German, he is economical, that is all, observed Tomsky. But if there is one person that I cannot understand, it is my grandmother, the Countess Anna Fedotovna. How so? inquired the guests. I cannot understand, continued Tomsky, how it is that my grandmother does not punt. What is there remarkable about an old lady of eighty not punting, said Naramov. Then you do not know the reason why. No, really, haven't the faintest idea. Oh. Then listen. About sixty years ago, my grandmother went to Paris, where she created quite a sensation. People used to run after her to catch a glimpse of the Muscovite Venus. Richelieu made love to her, and my grandmother maintains that he almost blew out his brains in consequence of her cruelty. At that time ladies used to play at Pharaoh. On one occasion at the court, she lost a very considerable sum to the Duke of Orleans. On returning home, my grandmother removed the patches from her face, took off her hoops, informed my grandfather of her loss at the gaming table, and ordered him to pay the money. My deceased grandfather, as far as I remember, was a sort of house steward to my grandmother. He dreaded her like fire, but, on hearing of such a heavy loss, he almost went out of his mind. He calculated the various sums she had lost, and pointed out to her that in six months she had spent half a million francs, that neither their Moscow nor Saratov estates were in Paris. And finally refused point-blank to pay the debt. My grandmother gave him a box on the ear and slept by herself as a sign of her displeasure. The next day she sent for her husband, hoping that this domestic punishment had produced an effect upon him, but she found him inflexible. First time in her life, she entered into reasonings and explanations with him, thinking to be able to convince him by pointing out to him that there are debts and debts. And that there is a great difference between a prince and a coachmaker. But it was all in vain, my grandfather still remained obdurate. But the matter did not rest there. My grandmother did not know what to do. She had shortly before become acquainted with a very remarkable man. You have heard of Count St. Germain, about whom so many marvelous stories are told. You know that he represented himself as the wandering Jew, as the discoverer of the elixir of life, of the philosopher's stone, and so forth. Some laughed at him as a charlatan, but Casanova, in his memoirs, says that he was a spy. But be that as it may, St. Germain, in spite of the mysteries surrounding him, was a very fascinating person, and was much sought after in the best circles of society. Even to this day my grandmother retains an affectionate recollection of him, and becomes quite angry if anyone speaks disrespectfully of him. My grandmother knew that St. Germain had large sums of money at his disposal. She resolved to have recourse to him, and she wrote a letter to him asking him to come to her without delay. The queer old man immediately waited upon her and found her overwhelmed with grief. She described to him in the blackest colors the barbarity of her husband, and ended by declaring that her whole hope depended upon his friendship and amiability. Street Germain reflected. I could advance you the sum you want, said he, but I know that you would not rest easy until you had paid me back, and I should not like to bring fresh troubles upon you. But there is another way of getting out of your difficulty, you can win back your money. But, my dear Count, replied my grandmother, I tell you that I haven't any money left. Money is not necessary, replied St. Germain, be pleased to listen to me. Then he revealed to her a secret, for which each of us would give a good deal. The young officers listened with increased attention. Tomsky lit his pipe, puffed away for a moment and then continued. That same evening my grandmother went to Versailles to the Jeux de la Reine. 
The Duke of Orleans kept the bank, my grandmother excused herself in an offhand manner for not having yet paid her debt, by inventing some little story, and then began to play against him. She chose three cards and played them one after the other. All three won Seneca, and my grandmother recovered every farthing that she had lost. Mere chance, said one of the guests. A tale, observed Hermon. Perhaps they were marked cards, said a third. I do not think so, replied Tomsky gravely. What, said Naramov, you have a grandmother who knows how to hit upon three lucky cards in succession, and you have never yet succeeded in getting the secret of it out of her? That's the deuce of it, replied Tomsky, she had four sons, one of whom was my father. All four were determined gamblers, and yet not to one of them did she ever reveal her secret, although it would not have been a bad thing either for them or for me. But this is what I heard from my uncle, Count Ivan Ilyich, and he assured me, on his honor, that it was true. The late Chaplitsky, the same who died in poverty after having squandered millions, once lost, in his youth, about 300,000 rubles, to Zorik, if I remember rightly. He was in despair. My grandmother, who was always very severe upon the extravagance of young men, took pity, however, upon Chaplitsky. She gave him three cards, telling him to play them one after the other, at the same time exacting from him a solemn promise that he would never play at cards again as long as he lived. Chaplitsky then went to his victorious opponent, and they began a fresh game. On the first card he staked 50,000 rubles and won Seneca, he doubled the stake and won again, till at last, by pursuing the same tactics, he won back more than he had lost. But it is time to go to bed, it is a quarter to six already. And indeed it was already beginning to dawn, the young men emptied their glasses and then took leave of each other. Part 2 the old Countess A. was seated in her dressing room in front of her looking glass. Three waiting maids stood around her. One held a small pot of rouge, another a box of hairpins, and the third a tall kin with bright red ribbons. The Countess had no longer the slightest pretensions to beauty, but she still preserved the habits of her youth, dressed in strict accordance with the fashion of seventy years before, and made as long and as careful a toilette as she would have done sixty years previously. Near the window, at an embroidery frame, sat a young lady, her ward. Good morning, grandmama, said a young officer, entering the room. Bonjour, mademoiselle Lees. Grandmama, I want to ask you something. What is it, Paul? I want you to let me introduce one of my friends to you, and to allow me to bring him to the ball on Friday. Bring him direct to the ball and introduce him to me there. Were you at B.S. yesterday? Yes, everything went off very pleasantly, and dancing was kept up until five o'clock. How charming Yelitskaya was. But, my dear, what is there charming about her? Isn't she like her grandmother, the Princess Daria Petrovna? By the way, she must be very old, the Princess Daria Petrovna. How do you mean, old, cried Tomsky thoughtlessly, she died seven years ago. The young lady raised her head and made a sign to the young officer. He then remembered that the old countess was never to be informed of the death of any of her contemporaries, and he bit his lips. But the old countess heard the news with the greatest indifference. Dead, said she, and I did not know it. We were appointed maids of honor at the same time, and when we were presented to the empress. And the countess for the hundredth time related to her grandson one of her anecdotes. Come, Paul, said she, when she had finished her story, help me to get up. Lizenka, where is my snuff box? And the countess with her three maids went behind a screen to finish her toilette. Tomsky was left alone with the young lady. Who is the gentleman you wish to introduce to the countess? asked Lizaveta Ivanovna in a whisper. Naramov. Do you know him? No. Is he a soldier or a civilian? A soldier. Is he in the engineers? No, in the cavalry. What made you think that he was in the engineers? The young lady smiled, but made no reply. Paul, cried the countess from behind the screen, send me some new novel, only pray don't let it be one of the present-day style. What do you mean, grandmother? That is, a novel, in which the hero strangles neither his father nor his mother, and in which there are no drowned bodies. I have a great horror of drowned persons. There are no such novels nowadays. Would you like a Russian one? Are there any Russian novels? Send me one, my dear, pray send me one. Good. Bye. Grandmother, I am in a hurry. Good. Bye. Lizaveta Ivanovna. What made you think that Naramov was in the engineers? And Tomsky left the boudoir.
Lizaveta Ivanovna was left alone, she laid aside her work and began to look out of the window. A few moments afterwards, at a corner house on the other side of the street, a young officer appeared. A deep blush covered her cheeks, she took up her work again and bent her head down over the frame. At the same moment the countess returned completely dressed. Order the carriage, Lizaveta, said she, we will go out for a drive. Lizaveta arose from the frame and began to arrange her work. What is the matter with you, my child, are you deaf, cried the countess. Order the carriage to be got ready at once. I will do so this moment, replied the young lady, hastening into the ante-room. A servant entered and gave the countess some books from Prince Paul Alexandrovich. Tell him that I am much obliged to him, said the countess. Lizaveta. Lizaveta. Where are you running to? I am going to dress. There is plenty of time, my dear. Sit down here. Open the first volume and read to me aloud. Her companion took the book and read a few lines. Louder, said the countess. What is the matter with you, my child? Have you lost your voice? Wait, give me that footstool, a little nearer, that will do. Lizaveta read two more pages. The countess yawned. Put the book down, said she, what a lot of nonsense. Send it back to Prince Paul with my thanks. But where is the carriage? The carriage is ready, said Lizaveta, looking out into the street. How is it that you are not dressed, said the countess, I must always wait for you. It is intolerable, my dear. Liza hastened to her room. She had not been there two minutes, before the countess began to ring with all her might. The three waiting maids came running in at one door and the valet at another. How is it that you cannot hear me when I ring for you, said the countess. Tell Lizaveta Ivanovna that I am waiting for her. Lizaveta returned with her hat and cloak on. At last you are here, said the countess. But why such an elaborate toilette? Whom do you intend to captivate? What sort of weather is it? It seems rather windy. No, your ladyship, it is very calm, replied the valet. You never think of what you are talking about. Open the window. So it is, windy and bitterly cold. Unharness the horses. Lizaveta, we won't go out, there was no need for you to deck yourself like that. What a life is mine, thought Lizaveta Ivanovna. And, in truth, Lizaveta Ivanovna was a very unfortunate creature. The bread of the stranger is bitter, says Dante, and his staircase hard to climb. But who can know what the bitterness of dependence is so well as the poor companion of an old lady of quality? The Countess A. had by no means a bad heart, but she was capricious, like a woman who had been spoilt by the world, as well as being avaricious and egotistical. Like all old people who have seen their best days, and whose thoughts are with the past and not the present. She participated in all the vanities of the great world, went to balls, where she sat in a corner, painted and dressed in old-fashioned style. Like a deformed but indispensable ornament of the ballroom. All the guests on entering approached her and made a profound bow, as if in accordance with a set ceremony, but after that nobody took any further notice of her. She received the whole town at her house, and observed the strictest etiquette, although she could no longer recognize the faces of people. Her numerous domestics, growing fat and old in her antechamber and servants' hall, did just as they liked, and vied with each other in robbing the aged countess in the most barefaced manner. Lizaveta Ivanovna was the martyr of the household. She made tea, and was reproached with using too much sugar, she read novels aloud to the countess, and the faults of the author were visited upon her head. She accompanied the countess in her walks, and was held answerable for the weather or the state of the pavement. A salary was attached to the post, but she very rarely received it, although she was expected to dress like everybody else, that is to say, like very few indeed. In society she played the most pitiable role. Everybody knew her, and nobody paid her any attention. At balls she danced only when a partner was wanted, and ladies would only take hold of her arm when it was necessary to lead her out of the room to attend to their dresses. She was very self-conscious, and felt her position keenly, and she looked about her with impatience for a deliverer to come to her rescue. But the young men, calculating in their giddiness, honored her with but very little attention. Although Lizaveta Ivanovna was a hundred times prettier than the barefaced and cold-hearted marriageable girls around whom they hovered. Many a time did she quietly slink away from the glittering but wearisome drawing-room, to go and cry in her own poor little room, in which stood a screen, a chest of drawers. 
a looking glass and a painted bedstead, and where a tallow candle burnt feebly in a copper candlestick. One morning, this was about two days after the evening party described at the beginning of this story. And a week previous to the scene at which we have just assisted, Lizaveta Ivanovna was seated near the window at her embroidery frame, when, happening to look out into the street, she caught sight of a young engineer officer, standing motionless with his eyes fixed upon her window. She lowered her head and went on again with her work. About five minutes afterwards she looked out again, the young officer was still standing in the same place. Not being in the habit of coquetting with passing officers, she did not continue to gaze out into the street, but went on sewing for a couple of hours, without raising her head. Dinner was announced. She rose up and began to put her embroidery away, but glancing casually out of the window, she perceived the officer again. This seemed to her very strange. After dinner she went to the window with a certain feeling of uneasiness, but the officer was no longer there, and she thought no more about him. A couple of days afterwards, just as she was stepping into the carriage with the countess, she saw him again. He was standing close behind the door, with his face half concealed by his fur collar, but his dark eyes sparkled beneath his cap. Lizaveta felt alarmed, though she knew not why, and she trembled as she seated herself in the carriage. On returning home, she hastened to the window, the officer was standing in his accustomed place, with his eyes fixed upon her. She drew back, a prey to curiosity and agitated by a feeling which was quite new to her. From that time forward not a day passed without the young officer making his appearance under the window at the customary hour. And between him and her there was established a sort of mute acquaintance. Sitting in her place at work, she used to feel his approach, and raising her head, she would look at him longer and longer each day. The young man seemed to be very grateful to her, she saw with the sharp eye of youth, how a sudden flush covered his pale cheeks each time that their glances met. After about a week she commenced to smile at him. When Tomsky asked permission of his grandmother the countess to present one of his friends to her, the young girl's heart beat violently. But hearing that Naramov was not an engineer, she regretted that by her thoughtless question, she had betrayed her secret to the volatile Tomsky. Hermann was the son of a German who had become a naturalized Russian, and from whom he had inherited a small capital. Being firmly convinced of the necessity of preserving his independence, Hermann did not touch his private income, but lived on his pay, without allowing himself the slightest luxury. Moreover, he was reserved and ambitious, and his companions rarely had an opportunity of making merry at the expense of his extreme parsimony. He had strong passions and an ardent imagination, but his firmness of disposition preserved him from the ordinary errors of young men. Thus, though a gamester at heart, he never touched a card, for he considered his position did not allow him, as he said, to risk the necessary in the hope of winning the superfluous. Yet he would sit for nights together at the card table and follow with feverish anxiety the different turns of the game. The story of the three cards had produced a powerful impression upon his imagination, and all night long he could think of nothing else. If, he thought to himself the following evening, as he walked along the streets of St. Petersburg, if the old countess would but reveal her secret to me. If she would only tell me the names of the three winning cards. Why should I not try my fortune? I must get introduced to her and win her favor, become her lover. But all that will take time, and she is eighty-seven years old. She might be dead in a week, in a couple of days even. But the story itself, can it really be true? No. Economy, temperance and industry, those are my three winning cards, by means of them I shall be able to double my capital, increase it sevenfold, and procure for myself ease and independence. Musing in this manner, he walked on until he found himself in one of the principal streets of St. Petersburg, in front of a house of antiquated architecture. The street was blocked with equipages, carriages one after the other drew up in front of the brilliantly illuminated doorway. At one moment there stepped out onto the pavement the well-shaped little foot of some young beauty, at another the heavy boot of a cavalry officer. And then the silk stockings and shoes of a member of the diplomatic world. Furs and cloaks passed in rapid succession before the gigantic porter at the entrance. Hermann stopped. Whose house is this, he asked of the watchman at the corner. 
The Countess A. S. replied the watchman. Hermann started. The strange story of the three cards again presented itself to his imagination. He began walking up and down before the house, thinking of its owner and her strange secret. Returning late to his modest lodging, he could not go to sleep for a long time, and when at last he did doze off, he could dream of nothing but cards, green tables, piles of banknotes and heaps of ducats. He played one card after the other, winning uninterruptedly, and then he gathered up the gold and filled his pockets with the notes. When he woke up late the next morning, he sighed over the loss of his imaginary wealth, and then sallying out into the town, he found himself once more in front of the countess's residence. Some unknown power seemed to have attracted him thither. He stopped and looked up at the windows. At one of these he saw a head with luxuriant black hair, which was bent down probably over some book or an embroidery frame. The head was raised. Hermann saw a fresh complexion and a pair of dark eyes. That moment decided his fate. Part 3 Lizaveta Ivanovna had scarcely taken off her hat and cloak, when the countess sent for her and again ordered her to get the carriage ready. The vehicle drew up before the door, and they prepared to take their seats. Just at the moment when two footmen were assisting the old lady to enter the carriage, Lizaveta saw her engineer standing close beside the wheel, he grasped her hand. Alarm caused her to lose her presence of mind, and the young man disappeared, but not before he had left a letter between her fingers. She concealed it in her glove, and during the whole of the drive she neither saw nor heard anything. It was the custom of the countess, when out for an airing in her carriage, to be constantly asking such questions as, who was that person that met us just now? What is the name of this bridge? What is written on that signboard? On this occasion, however, Lizavita returned such vague and absurd answers, that the countess became angry with her. What is the matter with you, my dear, she exclaimed. Have you taken leave of your senses, or what is it? Do you not hear me or understand what I say? Heaven be thanked, I am still in my right mind and speak plainly enough. Lizaveta Ivanovna did not hear her. On returning home she ran to her room and drew the letter out of her glove, it was not sealed. Lizaveta read it. The letter contained a declaration of love, it was tender, respectful, and copied word for word from a German novel. But Lizaveta did not know anything of the German language, and she was quite delighted. For all that, the letter caused her to feel exceedingly uneasy. For the first time in her life she was entering into secret and confidential relations with a young man. His boldness alarmed her. She reproached herself for her imprudent behavior and knew not what to do. Should she cease to sit at the window and, by assuming an appearance of indifference towards him, put a check upon the young officer's desire for further acquaintance with her? Should she send his letter back to him, or should she answer him in a cold and decided manner? There was nobody to whom she could turn in her perplexity, for she had neither female friend nor adviser. At length she resolved to reply to him. She sat down at her little writing table, took pen and paper, and began to think. Several times she began her letter, and then tore it up, the way she had expressed herself seemed to her either too inviting or too cold and decisive. At last she succeeded in writing a few lines with which she felt satisfied. I am convinced, she wrote, that your intentions are honorable, and that you do not wish to offend me by any imprudent behavior, but our acquaintance must not begin in such a manner. I return you your letter, and I hope that I shall never have any cause to complain of this undeserved slight. The next day, as soon as Hermann made his appearance, Lizaveta rose from her embroidery, went into the drawing room, opened the ventilator and threw the letter into the street. Trusting that the young officer would have the perception to pick it up. Hermann hastened forward, picked it up and then repaired to a confectioner's shop. Breaking the seal of the envelope, he found inside it his own letter and Lizaveta's reply. He had expected this, and he returned home, his mind deeply occupied with his intrigue. Three days afterwards, a bright-eyed young girl from a milliner's establishment brought Lizaveta a letter. Lizaveta opened it with great uneasiness, fearing that it was a demand for money, when suddenly she recognized Hermann's handwriting. You have made a mistake, my dear, said she, this letter is not for me. Oh, yes, it is for you, replied the girl, smiling very knowingly. Have the goodness to read it. 
Lizavita glanced at the letter. Herman requested an interview. It cannot be, she cried, alarmed at the audacious request, and the manner in which it was made. This letter is certainly not for me. And she tore it into fragments. If the letter was not for you, why have you torn it up, said the girl. I should have given it back to the person who sent it. Be good enough, my dear, said Lizavita, disconcerted by this remark, not to bring me any more letters for the future, and tell the person who sent you that he ought to be ashamed. But Hermann was not the man to be thus put off. Every day Lizavita received from him a letter, sent now in this way, now in that. They were no longer translated from the German. Hermann wrote them under the inspiration of passion, and spoke in his own language. And they bore full testimony to the inflexibility of his desire and the disordered condition of his uncontrollable imagination. Lizavita no longer thought of sending them back to him, she became intoxicated with them and began to reply to them, and little by little her answers became longer and more affectionate. At last she threw out of the window to him the following letter. This evening there is going to be a ball at the embassy. The countess will be there. We shall remain until two o'clock. You have now an opportunity of seeing me alone. As soon as the countess is gone, the servants will very probably go out, and there will be nobody left but the Swiss, but he usually goes to sleep in his lodge. Come about half past eleven. Walk straight upstairs. If you meet anybody in the ante room, ask if the countess is at home. You will be told no, in which case there will be nothing left for you to do but to go away again. But it is most probable that you will meet nobody. The maid servants will all be together in one room. On leaving the ante room, turn to the left and walk straight on until you reach the countess's bedroom. In the bedroom, behind a screen, you will find two doors. The one on the right leads to a cabinet, which the countess never enters. The one on the left leads to a corridor, at the end of which is a little winding staircase, this leads to my room. Hermann trembled like a tiger, as he waited for the appointed time to arrive. At ten o'clock in the evening he was already in front of the countess's house. The weather was terrible, the wind blew with great violence, the sleety snow fell in large flakes, the lamps emitted a feeble light, the streets were deserted. From time to time a sledge, drawn by a sorry-looking hack, passed by, on the lookout for a belated passenger. Hermann was enveloped in a thick overcoat, and felt neither wind nor snow. At last the countess's carriage drew up. Hermann saw two footmen carry out in their arms the bent form of the old lady, wrapped in sable fur, and immediately behind her, clad in a warm mantle, and with her head ornamented with a wreath of fresh flowers, followed Lizavita. The door was closed. The carriage rolled away heavily through the yielding snow. The porter shut the street door, the windows became dark. Hermann began walking up and down near the deserted house, at length he stopped under a lamp, and glanced at his watch, it was twenty minutes past eleven. He remained standing under the lamp, his eyes fixed upon the watch, impatiently waiting for the remaining minutes to pass. At half past eleven precisely, Hermann ascended the steps of the house, and made his way into the brightly illuminated vestibule. The porter was not there. Hermann hastily ascended the staircase, opened the door of the ante room, and saw a footman sitting asleep in an antique chair by the side of a lamp. With a light firm step, Hermann passed by him. The drawing room and dining room were in darkness, but a feeble reflection penetrated thither from the lamp in the ante room. Hermann reached the countess's bedroom. Before a shrine, which was full of old images, a golden lamp was burning. Faded stuffed chairs and divans with soft cushions stood in melancholy symmetry around the room, the walls of which were hung with china silk. On one side of the room hung two portraits painted in Paris by Madame Lebrun. One of these represented a stout, red-faced man of about forty years of age in a bright green uniform and with a star upon his breast. The other, a beautiful young woman, with an aquiline nose, forehead curls and a rose in her powdered hair. 
In the corners stood porcelain shepherds and shepherdesses, dining room clocks from the workshop of the celebrated Lefroy, bandboxes, roulettes, fans, and the various playthings for the amusement of ladies that were in vogue at the end of the last century, when Montgolfier's balloons and Mesmer's magnetism were the rage. Hermann stepped behind the screen. At the back of it stood a little iron bedstead, on the right was the door which led to the cabinet, on the left, the other which led to the corridor. He opened the ladder and saw the little winding staircase which led to the room of the poor companion. But he retraced his steps and entered the dark cabinet. The time passed slowly. All was still. The clock in the drawing room struck twelve, the strokes echoed through the room one after the other, and everything was quiet again. Hermann stood leaning against the cold stove. He was calm, his heart beat regularly, like that of a man resolved upon a dangerous but inevitable undertaking. One o'clock in the morning struck, then two, and he heard the distant noise of carriage wheels. An involuntary agitation took possession of him. The carriage drew near and stopped. He heard the sound of the carriage steps being let down. All was bustle within the house. The servants were running hither and thither, there was a confusion of voices, and the rooms were lit up. Three antiquated chambermaids entered the bedroom, and they were shortly afterwards followed by the countess who, more dead than alive, sank into a Voltaire armchair. Hermann peeped through a chink. Lizaveta Ivanovna passed close by him, and he heard her hurried steps as she hastened up the little spiral staircase. For a moment his heart was assailed by something like a pricking of conscience, but the emotion was only transitory, and his heart became petrified as before. The countess began to undress before her looking-glass. Her rose-bedecked cap was taken off, and then her powdered wig was removed from off her white and closely cut hair. Hairpins fell in showers around her. Her yellow satin dress, brocaded with silver, fell down at her swollen feet. Hermann was a witness of the repugnant mysteries of her toilette. At last the countess was in her nightcap and dressing gown, and in this costume, more suitable to her age, she appeared less hideous and deformed. Like all old people in general, the countess suffered from sleeplessness. Having undressed, she seated herself at the window in a Voltaire armchair and dismissed her maids. The candles were taken away, and once more the room was left with only one lamp burning in it. The countess sat there looking quite yellow, mumbling with her flaccid lips and swaying to and fro. Her dull eyes expressed complete vacancy of mind, and, looking at her, one would have thought that the rocking of her body was not a voluntary action of her own, but was produced by the action of some concealed galvanic mechanism. Suddenly the death-like face assumed an inexplicable expression. The lips ceased to tremble, the eyes became animated, before the countess stood an unknown man. Do not be alarmed, for heaven's sake, do not be alarmed, said he in a low but distinct voice. I have no intention of doing you any harm, I have only come to ask a favor of you. The old woman looked at him in silence, as if she had not heard what he had said. Hermann thought that she was deaf, and bending down towards her ear, he repeated what he had said. The aged countess remained silent as before. You can ensure the happiness of my life, continued Hermann, and it will cost you nothing. I know that you can name three cards in order. Hermann stopped. The countess appeared now to understand what he wanted, she seemed as if seeking for words to reply. It was a joke, she replied at last, I assure you it was only a joke. There is no joking about the matter, replied Hermann angrily. Remember Chaplitsky, whom you helped to win. The countess became visibly uneasy. Her features expressed strong emotion, but they quickly resumed their former immobility. Can you not name me these three winning cards? continued Hermann. The countess remained silent, Hermann continued. For whom are you preserving your secret? For your grandsons? They are rich enough without it, they do not know the worth of money. Your cards would be of no use to a spendthrift. He who cannot preserve his paternal inheritance, will die in want, even though he had a demon at his service. I am not a man of that sort, I know the value of money. Your three cards will not be thrown away upon me. Come. He paused and tremblingly awaited her reply. The countess remained silent, 
Hermon fell upon his knees. If your heart has ever known the feeling of love, said he, if you remember its rapture, if you have ever smiled at the cry of your newborn child. If any human feeling has ever entered into your breast, I entreat you by the feelings of a wife, a lover, a mother, by all that is most sacred in life, not to reject my prayer. Reveal to me your secret. Of what use is it to you? Maybe it is connected with some terrible sin, with the loss of eternal salvation, with some bargain with the devil. Reflect, you are old. You have not long to live, I am ready to take your sins upon my soul. Only reveal to me your secret. Remember that the happiness of a man is in your hands, that not only I, but my children, and grandchildren will bless your memory and reverence you as a saint. The old countess answered not a word. Hermon rose to his feet. You old hag, he exclaimed, grinding his teeth, then I will make you answer. With these words he drew a pistol from his pocket. At the sight of the pistol, the countess for the second time exhibited strong emotion. She shook her head and raised her hands as if to protect herself from the shot. Then she fell backwards and remained motionless. Come, an end to this childish nonsense, said Hermon, taking hold of her hand. I ask you for the last time, will you tell me the names of your three cards, or will you not? The countess made no reply. Hermon perceived that she was dead. Part 4 Lizaveta Ivanovna was sitting in her room, still in her ball dress, lost in deep thought. On returning home, she had hastily dismissed the chambermaid who very reluctantly came forward to assist her, saying that she would undress herself. And with a trembling heart had gone up to her own room, expecting to find Hermon there, but yet hoping not to find him. At the first glance she convinced herself that he was not there, and she thanked her fate for having prevented him keeping the appointment. She sat down without undressing, and began to recall to mind all the circumstances which in so short a time had carried her so far. It was not three weeks since the time when she first saw the young officer from the window, and yet she was already in correspondence with him. And he had succeeded in inducing her to grant him a nocturnal interview. She knew his name only through his having written it at the bottom of some of his letters. She had never spoken to him, had never heard his voice, and had never heard him spoken of until that evening. But, strange to say, that very evening at the ball, Tomsky, being piqued with the young princess Pauline N., who, contrary to her usual custom, did not flirt with him, wished to revenge himself by assuming an air of indifference, he therefore engaged Lizaveta Ivanovna and danced an endless mazurka with her. During the whole of the time he kept teasing her about her partiality for engineer officers. He assured her that he knew far more than she imagined, and some of his jests were so happily aimed, that Lizaveta thought several times that her secret was known to him. From whom have you learnt all this? she asked, smiling. From a friend of a person very well known to you, replied Tomsky, from a very distinguished man. And who is this distinguished man? His name is Hermon. Lizaveta made no reply, but her hands and feet lost all sense of feeling. This Hermon, continued Tomsky, is a man of romantic personality. He has the profile of a Napoleon, and the soul of a Mephistopheles. I believe that he has at least three crimes upon his conscience. How pale you have become! I have a headache. But what did this Hermon, or whatever his name is, tell you? Hermon is very much dissatisfied with his friend, he says that in his place he would act very differently. I even think that Hermon himself has designs upon you. At least, he listens very attentively to all that his friend has to say about you. And where has he seen me? In church, perhaps, or on the parade, God alone knows where. It may have been in your room, while you were asleep, for there is nothing that he Three ladies approaching him with the question, ugly oh you regret, interrupted the conversation, which had become so tantalizingly interesting to Lizaveta. The lady chosen by Tomsky was the Princess Pauline herself. She succeeded in effecting a reconciliation with him during the numerous turns of the dance, after which he conducted her to her chair. On returning to his place, Tomsky thought no more either of Hermon or Lizaveta. 
She longed to renew the interrupted conversation, but the mazurka came to an end, and shortly afterwards the old countess took her departure. Tomsky's words were nothing more than the customary small talk of the dance, but they sank deep into the soul of the young dreamer. The portrait, sketched by Tomsky, coincided with the picture she had formed within her own mind, and thanks to the latest romances. The ordinary countenance of her admirer became invested with attributes capable of alarming her and fascinating her imagination at the same time. She was now sitting with her bare arms crossed and with her head, still adorned with flowers, sunk upon her uncovered bosom. Suddenly the door opened and Hermann entered. She shuddered. Where were you? she asked in a terrified whisper. In the old countess's bedroom, replied Hermann, I have just left her. The countess is dead. My God! What do you say? And I am afraid, added Hermann, that I am the cause of her death. Lizaveta looked at him, and Tomsky's words found an echo in her soul. This man has at least three crimes upon his conscience. Hermann sat down by the window near her, and related all that had happened. Lizaveta listened to him in terror. So all those passionate letters, those ardent desires, this bold obstinate pursuit, all this was not love. Money, that was what his soul yearned for. She could not satisfy his desire and make him happy. The poor girl had been nothing but the blind tool of a robber, of the murderer of her aged benefactress. She wept bitter tears of agonized repentance. Hermann gazed at her in silence. His heart, too, was a prey to violent emotion, but neither the tears of the poor girl, nor the wonderful charm of her beauty, enhanced by her grief, could produce any impression upon his hardened soul. He felt no pricking of conscience at the thought of the dead old woman. One thing only grieved him, the irreparable loss of the secret from which he had expected to obtain great wealth. You are a monster, said Lizavita at last. I did not wish for her death, replied Hermann, my pistol was not loaded. Both remained silent. The day began to dawn. Lizavita extinguished her candle, a pale light illumined her room. She wiped her tear-stained eyes and raised them towards Hermann, he was sitting near the window, with his arms crossed and with a fierce frown upon his forehead. In this attitude he bore a striking resemblance to the portrait of Napoleon. This resemblance struck Lizavita even. How shall I get you out of the house, said she at last. I thought of conducting you down the secret staircase, but in that case it would be necessary to go through the countess's bedroom, and I am afraid. Tell me how to find the secret staircase, I will go alone. Lizavita arose, took from her drawer a key, handed it to Hermann and gave him the necessary instructions. Hermann pressed her cold, limp hand, kissed her bowed head, and left the room. He descended the winding staircase, and once more entered the countess's bedroom. The dead old lady sat as if petrified, her face expressed profound tranquility. Hermann stopped before her, and gazed long and earnestly at her, as if he wished to convince himself of the terrible reality. At last he entered the cabinet, felt behind the tapestry for the door, and then began to descend the dark staircase, filled with strange emotions. Down this very staircase, thought he, perhaps coming from the very same room, and at this very same hour sixty years ago, there may have glided, in an embroidered coat. With his hair dressed Aloiso royal and pressing to his heart his three-cornered hat, some young gallant, who has long been mouldering in the grave. But the heart of his aged mistress has only today ceased to beat. At the bottom of the staircase Hermann found a door, which he opened with a key, and then traversed a corridor which conducted him into the street. Part V. Three days after the fatal night, at nine o'clock in the morning, Hermann repaired to the convent of, where the last honors were to be paid to the mortal remains of the old countess. Although feeling no remorse, he could not altogether stifle the voice of conscience, which said to him, You are the murderer of the old woman. In spite of his entertaining very little religious belief, he was exceedingly superstitious. And believing that the dead countess might exercise an evil influence on his life, he resolved to be present at her obsequies in order to implore her pardon. The church was full. It was with difficulty that Hermann made his way through the crowd of people. The coffin was placed upon a rich catafalque beneath a velvet baldachin. The deceased countess lay within it, 
with her hands crossed upon her breast, with a lace cap upon her head and dressed in a white satin robe. Around the catafalque stood the members of her household, the servants in black caftans, with armorial ribbons upon their shoulders, and candles in their hands. The relatives, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, in deep mourning. Nobody wept, tears would have been an affectation. The countess was so old that her death could have surprised nobody, and her relatives had long looked upon her as being out of the world. A famous preacher pronounced the funeral sermon. In simple and touching words he described the peaceful passing away of the righteous, who had passed long years in calm preparation for a Christian end. The angel of death found her, said the orator, engaged in pious meditation and waiting for the midnight bridegroom. The service concluded amidst profound silence. The relatives went forward first to take farewell of the corpse. Then followed the numerous guests who had come to render the last homage to her who for so many years had been a participator in their frivolous amusements. After these followed the members of the countess's household. The last of these was an old woman of the same age as the deceased. Two young women led her forward by the hand. She had not strength enough to bow down to the ground, she merely shed a few tears and kissed the cold hand of her mistress. Hermann now resolved to approach the coffin. He knelt down upon the cold stones and remained in that position for some minutes, at last he arose, as pale as the deceased countess herself. He ascended the steps of the catafalque and bent over the corpse. At that moment it seemed to him that the dead woman darted a mocking look at him and winked with one eye. Hermann started back, took a false step and fell to the ground. Several persons hurried forward and raised him up. At the same moment Lizaveta Ivanovna was born fainting into the porch of the church. This episode disturbed for some minutes the solemnity of the gloomy ceremony. Among the congregation arose a deep murmur, and a tall thin chamberlain, a near relative of the deceased, whispered in the ear of an Englishman who was standing near him. That the young officer was a natural son of the countess, to which the Englishman coldly replied, Oh. During the whole of that day, Hermann was strangely excited. Repairing to an out-of-the-way restaurant to dine, he drank a great deal of wine, contrary to his usual custom, in the hope of deadening his inward agitation. But the wine only served to excite his imagination still more. On returning home, he threw himself upon his bed without undressing, and fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up it was already night, and the moon was shining into the room. He looked at his watch, it was a quarter to three. Sleep had left him, he sat down upon his bed and thought of the funeral of the old countess. At that moment somebody in the street looked in at his window, and immediately passed on again. Hermann paid no attention to this incident. A few moments afterwards he heard the door of his anteroom open. Hermann thought that it was his orderly, drunk as usual, returning from some nocturnal expedition, but presently he heard footsteps that were unknown to him. Somebody was walking softly over the floor in slippers. The door opened, and a woman dressed in white, entered the room. Hermann mistook her for his old nurse, and wondered what could bring her there at that hour of the night. But the white woman glided rapidly across the room and stood before him, and Hermann recognized the countess. I have come to you against my wish, she said in a firm voice, but I have been ordered to grant your request. Three, seven, ace, will win for you if played in succession, but only on these conditions that you do not play more than one card in twenty-four hours, and that you never play again during the rest of your life. I forgive you my death, on condition that you marry my companion, Lizaveta Ivanovna. With these words she turned round very quietly, walked with a shuffling gait towards the door, and disappeared. Hermann heard the street door open and shut, and again he saw someone looking at him through the window. For a long time Hermann could not recover himself. He then rose up and entered the next room. His orderly was lying asleep upon the floor, and he had much difficulty in waking him. The orderly was drunk as usual, and no information could be obtained from him. The street door was locked. Hermann returned to his room, lit his candle, and wrote down all the details of his vision. Part 6 Two fixed ideas can no more exist together in the moral world than two bodies can occupy one and the same place in the physical world. Three, seven, ace, soon drove out of Hermann's mind the thought of the dead countess. 
three, seven if ace, were perpetually running through his head and continually being repeated by his lips. If he saw a young girl, he would say, how slender she is. Quite like the three of hearts. If anybody asked, what is the time, he would reply, five minutes to seven. Every stout man that he saw reminded him of the ace. Three, seven, ace haunted him in his sleep and assumed all possible shapes. The trees bloomed before him in the forms of magnificent flowers, the sevens were represented by gothic portals, and the aces transformed into gigantic spiders. One thought alone occupied his whole mind, to make a profitable use of the secret which he had purchased so dearly. He thought of applying for a furlough so as to travel abroad. He wanted to go to Paris and tempt fortune in some of the public gambling houses that abounded there. Chance spared him all this trouble. There was in Moscow a society of rich gamesters, presided over by the celebrated Chekolinsky, who had passed all his life at the card table and had amassed millions. Accepting bills of exchange for his winnings and paying his losses in ready money. His long experience secured for him the confidence of his companions, and his open house, his famous cook, and his agreeable and fascinating manners gained for him the respect of the public. He came to St. Petersburg. The young men of the capital flocked to his rooms, forgetting balls for cards, and preferring the emotions of Pharaoh to the seductions of flirting. Naramov conducted Hermon to Chekolinsky's residence. They passed through a suite of magnificent rooms, filled with attentive domestics. The place was crowded. Generals and privy councillors were playing at whist, young men were lolling carelessly upon the velvet-covered sofas, eating ices and smoking pipes. In the drawing room, at the head of a long table, around which were assembled about a score of players, sat the master of the house keeping the bank. He was a man of about sixty years of age, of a very dignified appearance, his head was covered with silvery white hair. His full, florid countenance expressed good nature, and his eyes twinkled with a perpetual smile. Naramov introduced Hermon to him. Chekolinsky shook him by the hand in a friendly manner, requested him not to stand in the ceremony, and then went on dealing. The game occupied some time. On the table lay more than thirty cards. Chekolinsky paused after each throw, in order to give the players time to arrange their cards and note down their losses, listen politely to their requests, and more politely still. Put straight the corners of cards that some player's hand had chanced to bend. At last the game was finished. Chekolinsky shuffled the cards and prepared to deal again. Will you allow me to take a card, said Hermann, stretching out his hand from behind a stout gentleman who was punting, Chekolinsky smiled and bowed silently, as a sign of acquiescence. Naramov laughingly congratulated Hermann on his abjuration of that abstention from cards which he had practiced for so long a period, and wished him a lucky beginning. Stake, said Hermann, writing some figures with chalk on the back of his card. How much? asked the banker, contracting the muscles of his eyes, excuse me, I cannot see quite clearly. Forty-seven thousand rubles, replied Hermann. At these words every head in the room turned suddenly round, and all eyes were fixed upon Hermann. He has taken leave of his senses, thought Naramov. Allow me to inform you, said Chekolinsky, with his eternal smile, that you are playing very high, nobody here has ever staked more than two hundred and seventy-five rubles at once. Very well, replied Hermann, but do you accept my card or not? Chekolinsky bowed in token of consent. I only wish to observe, said he, that although I have the greatest confidence in my friends, I can only play against ready money. For my own part, I am quite convinced that your word is sufficient, but for the sake of the order of the game, and to facilitate the reckoning up, I must ask you to put the money on your card. Hermann drew from his pocket a banknote and handed it to Chekolinsky, who, after examining it in a cursory manner, placed it on Hermann's card. He began to deal. On the right a nine turned up, and on the left a three. I have one, said Hermann, showing his card. A murmur of astonishment arose among the players. Chekolinsky frowned, but the smile quickly returned to his face. Do you wish me to settle with you, he said to Hermann. If you please, replied the latter. Chekolinsky drew from his pocket a number of banknotes and paid at once. Hermann took up his money and left the table. Naramov could not recover from his astonishment. Hermann drank a glass of lemonade and returned home. 
The next evening he again repaired to Chekolinsky's. The host was dealing. Hermann walked up to the table, the punters immediately made room for him. Chekolinsky greeted him with a gracious bow. Hermann waited for the next deal, took a card and placed upon it his 47,000 rubles, together with his winnings of the previous evening. Chekolinsky began to deal. A knave turned up on the right, a seven on the left. Hermann showed his seven. There was a general exclamation. Chekolinsky was evidently ill at ease, but he counted out the 94,000 rubles and handed them over to Hermann who pocketed them in the coolest manner possible and immediately left the house. The next evening Hermann appeared again at the table. Everyone was expecting him. The generals and privy councillors left their whist in order to watch such extraordinary play. The young officers quitted their sofas, and even the servants crowded into the room. All pressed round Hermann. The other players left off punting, impatient to see how it would end. Hermann stood at the table and prepared to play alone against the pale, but still smiling Chekolinsky. Each opened a pack of cards. Chekolinsky shuffled. Hermann took a card and covered it with a pile of banknotes. It was like a duel. Deep silence reigned around. Chekolinsky began to deal, his hands trembled. On the right a queen turned up, and on the left an ace. Ace has won, cried Hermann, showing his card. Your queen has lost, said Chekolinsky, politely. Hermann started, instead of an ace, there lay before him the queen of spades. He could not believe his eyes, nor could he understand how he had made such a mistake. At that moment it seemed to him that the queen of spades smiled ironically and winked her eye at him. He was struck by her remarkable resemblance. The old countess, he exclaimed, seized with terror. Chekolinsky gathered up his winnings. For some time, Hermann remained perfectly motionless. When at last he left the table, there was a general commotion in the room. Splendidly punted, said the players. Chekolinsky shuffled the cards afresh, and the game went on as usual. Hermann went out of his mind, and is now confined in room number 17 of the Obikov Hospital. He never answers any questions, but he constantly mutters with unusual rapidity, 3, 7, ace. 3, 7, Queen. Lizaveta Ivanovna has married a very amiable young man, a son of the former steward of the old countess. He is in the service of the state somewhere, and is in receipt of a good income. Lizaveta is also supporting a poor relative. Tomsky has been promoted to the rank of captain, and has become the husband of the Princess Pauline.